Now, here's, here's something interesting. You, you can think about this for a minute. I went and saw an autistic woman speak at one point. Her name was Temple Grandin. She's really worth looking up. Temple Grandin is a very interesting person. She's very... I had Temple Grandin on my podcast, actually. I think he's had her, her on a podcast when I was looking for this video. Um, interesting woman. Seriously autistic when she was a child, but Seriously her mother autistic. and her worked her out of it so that she could be, she's very functional. She works as a professor. I don't remember where, it's in the Midwest somewhere. Now, she's famous not only be f for being a highly functional autistic person who talks a fair bit about what it's like to be autistic, but also for designing slaughterhouses across the United States. And the reason she can do that, as far as she's concerned, is because she thinks she thinks like an animal thinks. And so she doesn't, and, sh and she's identified maybe at least part of what the core problem is with autism. So she, the talk I heard her at was in Arizona, and, and it, it, was a, it was a really... Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite like a, I think it's become quite like a conservative figure. The reason why his popularity kind of skyrocketed, because he was in this whole debate about um, the use of pronouns, I think. An entrancing talk. She showed some, showed some really interesting pictures of animals. So what she's done is she's redesigned slaughterhouses so that when the animals enter the slaughterhouse, they go in a, like a spiral, mm. basically. They can't see what's around the corner, and the walls are high so they're not distracted by anything outside. So one of the things she showed, for example, was a bunch of cows going through a standard uh, sequence of, of gates, essentially. And off to the side, See, there was a windmill a... spinning and the co cows would stop because the windmill, they didn't understand what the windmill was and they'd stop or showed other pictures where cows were going down a pathway too. And there was a Coke can sitting in the middle of the pathway and the cows would all stop because they didn't know what to do with it. Or she had another picture of cows out in the middle of the field, all surrounding a briefcase, and they were all looking at the briefcase. And the cows didn't like anything that shouldn't be there and had a hard time mapping it. Now she said, here, here's a little exercise she did. She said, think of a church. Okay, so maybe you think, you, imagine a child's drawing of a church. Eh? It's like your standard house, like a pentag pentagon, right? Which is basically how children draw the front of a house with a steeple on top and maybe a cross on top of it or something like that, mm. which actually isn't at church. It's an icon of a church. And you think about how children draw houses too. Pentagon, rectangle, what is it, trapezoid, chimney, almost always with smoke, which is quite interesting. It's, it, I don't know where kids get that exactly, but they almost always draw Oops. a chimney with smoke, even though chimneys with smoke aren't that common anymore. But anyways, you, know, you, you can see what a child's picture of a house looks like in your imagination. Hmm. One of the things that you might want to think about is that is not a picture of a house at all. Right? It's an iconic representation that's kind of like a hieroglyph. Because no house looks like that. And then you think about how a child will draw a person. Circle, stick, 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 stick. And you show it to someone and they go, that's a person. It's like, really? It looks nothing like a person, right? It, I mean, you, you immediately recognize it as a person. But it looks nothing like a person. Well, what Grandin said was that when she thinks of a church, she has to think of a church she's seen. She can't take the set of all churches and abstract out an iconic representation and use that to represent the set of all churches. She has, she gets fixated on a specific exemplar. And she thinks... I think it's really important to highlight here that um, what Temple is was talking about, what Jordan was trying to explain is this idea of thinking in pictures. And um, Temple was a really big proponent that all autistic people fought in pictures like this, like the way that he's talking about. Um, the interview that I did with her when we were talking about some of the changes that have happened since um, she was within the autism magazine. She's kind of one of the biggest autism advocacy people um, around. She kind of brought it into the mainstream, like very much so. Um, very influential kind of figure of her time. But um, obviously got a lot of things wrong because it was from just her perspective. Just her perspective on things. And there's actually a lot of autistic, as, as you said, Kerry, you know, if you have an, have a Fantasia, it's probably going to be quite hard to think in pictures. <laughs> um, some people think in language. Um, I'm a very much language thinker. That's why I'm very interested in psychology, philosophy, things of that nature. Um, there is another one that, we're, that I think she was talking about. Maybe, maybe it's more like kinesthetic, like based in terms of like practically 
manipulating objects, things of that nature. Uh, but that's basically what he's talking about, is that this idea that, you know, um, we think in pictures, which is not completely always the right thing. Uh, but for her and for some autistic people, it can be can be like that. And, that. and the idea about the iconic representation of a house, it still holds true to some degree, not because, you know, it's, it's not a house. And I think, you know, I have, I've had a lot of those experiences of being like, what? Like, as a child, because, you know, obviously it doesn't make sense um, and that people have kind of have these icons that, like, represent something, but it's not actually the thing. It doesn't, didn't really kind of make sense to me when I was a kid. It's that abstract idea, that kind of non-certain, more kind of... I guess D different way of thinking about things. Not non-specific is probably the best word for it. That one of the problems with autistic people, and they have a very difficult time uh, developing language, by the way, is that they can't abstract out a generalized representation across a set of entities. They can't abstract, and yeah. then they and the, well, and of course, can. if you can't abstract, then it's also very difficult to manipulate the abstraction. It's less natural. We can. It's more learnt. It's less transiently learned. It has to be an active process. You see very strange behavior with autistic yeah, children, know, for example. Know, so very, they don't like people. And that's because people don't, don't like stay people. in their perceptual boxes. Like a human being is a very difficult thing to perceive because we're always shifting around and moving. And They don't like people. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of autistic people might agree with that. But um, I love people. I think people are great. Um, I don't like people because they're indirect, usually, and they're sometimes a bit hard to understand objectively, which is always going to be hard because lack of certainty, subjectivity, it's a quite a scary thing. Um, I guess that's kind of what he's trying to get at. Different things, like we don't stay in our categorical box, so autistic people have real trouble with other people. But they also have trouble, so for example, if your autistic child gets accustomed to your kitchen, let's mm. say, and you move a chair, then, then it, especially if they're severely autistic, they'll have an absolute fit about it. Because you think kitchen with chair moved, they think completely different place. I would say I've, I've had an experience with this recently. I don't live my, with my dad, but he recently renovated his front room. And I, I had quite a hard time like feeling comfortable in that place because I've always been you know, thought of the, like, the dining room like that. I mean, throwing a fit, definitely not the best language there, Mr. Jordan, but Mr. Peterson. <laughs> Meltdown, overstimulation, possibly not a fit. They can't abstract the, the, the constancies across the different situations and represent them abstractly. Welcome back, so Ned. I, I made this little diagram. I made this little diagram here to, to kind of give you a sense of what you might be doing when you're abstracting perceptually. And so you could say, think about something that's that complicated. It's sort of my model of how complex the world is, but the world is a lot more complex than that. But the world is made out of, everything is made out of littler things, and those littler things are made out of littler things, and so forth. And those things are nested inside bigger things, and so forth. And where you perceive on that level of, of abstraction is somewhat arbitrary. It has to be bounded by your, by your goals. That's the other thing, is that your perceptual structures are determined by the goals that you have at hand. I mean, some of that's, that's not completely true because your perceptual systems also have limitations, right? There's things you can't see or hear even if you need to. So there are limitations built in. But within that set of limitations, you're still trying to tune your perceptions to your motivated goals. And that's also very useful to think about when you're trying to understand artificial intelligence, because for human beings, without goals, there's no perception, because there's no filtering mechanism that you can use to determine the level of resolution at which you perceive. Anyway, so there's, the, <laughs> there's a thing made of smaller things which are made out of smaller things, and it's, so, it's kind of my iconic representation of the complexity of the world. And then you could think, well, what is this? How can you see this object? And I think if you just look at it, you can detect, it's like a Necker cube, you know, those cubes that, that, that are line drawings that you can see the front of and then it'll flip to the back. Have you seen those? So 
This is kind of Necker cube-like, or at least it is for me, in that when I look at it, my perceptions play around with it. Sometimes I focus on the kind of cross-like shape in the middle, and sometimes I can see these other lines, and then sometimes I'll focus on that square, and sometimes I can see the little dots there, or maybe one dot, and my perceptions are going like this, trying to fit a pattern to it. And I, you can kind of detect that when you're watching it. And so I would say, well, you have the options of perceiving this in its full complexity, or you can simplify it. Essentially, there's lots of ways you can simplify it, but some of them are laid out there. So you take the compl complex thing, you make a low resolution representation of it. So that's its rough, that's the rough area that all those dots occupy. That's the rough area bro broken down to its four most fundamental quadrants. That might be how you would look at it if, if this was a map of an orchard and you were trying to walk from south to north, that would be a useful representation. This combines this and this, that's... I think for autistic people, we, we can sometimes um, perceive things in a much kind of different way to people, I guess. And we might see the details a little bit more um, clearly, perhaps sometimes have a difficulty seeing the bigger picture. From my experience, this is just me talking about myself. Um, good in certain situations, perhaps not in other ones. Highest level of resolution that you can perceive this object at that's lower resolution than the object itself. So the first issue is, how should you look at things? Well, that's a problem that intelligence has to solve. So that's one of the problems that intelligence oh, goes Jordan. after. And then oh, okay. I think what happens is we have the thing comment. in itself. <laughs> And then we simplify it with a perception, and, and that's like a, an iconic representation. And then we, we nail the iconic representation with a word. And that's how we compress the world's complexity into something that we can manage. Mm. We take the complex thing, make it into an icon, and represent the icon with a word. Yes. And then when I throw you the word, so to speak, you decompose it into the icon, and then decompose it even further into the thing, if you can't, if you know the icon and you know the thing. And so then we can use shorthand, right? Because you have representational structures and so do I, and I'm just tossing you markers about your representational structures and you can unfold them. That's what you do when you're reading a novel. Because the novel comes alive in your imagination in your own idiosyncratic way. And it wouldn't Would you like me if to, you didn't um, understand the references of the novel. Reduce right? the speed. The, the novelist has to assume that your basic perceptual structures and your intuitions and your instincts are basically the same as his or hers. Because otherwise they have to assume that. Because otherwise they would be lost in it. So one of the criticisms that I think a lot of people have of Jordan Peterson is that he's very good at explaining... Why, why things happen in, in kind of a way, but it's not necessarily like a revelation, I guess. Basically what he's trying to say is like, you convert ideas of things into icons and then those icons into words. So you just like, instead of thinking of things as like pictures in your brain, like a picture of a house and saying, oh, that, that was a house, you think of a ha you see a house and then you see an icon and then you, you see a word and you use that word. And it's just a basic way of interpreting communication, I guess. <laughs> Infinite regressive explanation. So and it, it's problematic often. For example, if you start reading Victorian novels, you may find that it takes a while to get into them because the presuppositions the expectations are slightly different, and so mm. is the language. You have to update the representation. Same culture. But mm. anyway, so that's roughly, as far as I'm concerned, that's roughly a representation of what intelligence is doing in the world, it's, or a big part of it. It's how in the world do you look at things so that you can use them for the purposes that you need to use them for. And then the next problem that intelligence has to solve, which is related, is once you've got the perceptual landscape sorted out, how do you abstractly represent the action patterns that you're going to implement in the world. So it's, how do you perceive where you are now? How do you perceive where you're going? And how do you construct up and then implement strategies that enable you to move from where you are to where you're going? How you're doing things. What are you going to do with things, basically? So it's a continual process of mapping and movement.
And so it's, it's, it's navigation. That's what we're doing in the world all the time is navigating through it because we're mobile creatures. We're navigating through it, attempting to make the world manifest itself in accordance with our wishes. And that's the fundamental problem that intelligence has to solve. And animals have their perceptions to rely on, but we have our perceptions and our ability to abstract from those perceptions multiple times and then That's to the abstract finally into, into language. So we live in a very abstracted world. And it's, it, it's not, not also something that's just that humans experience. Um, animals do as well. I think the best example of that is a crow. Crows are probably one of the more intelligent animals that you can come across. I think it's a crow. It might be a raven. Um, it's a particular breed, particular species of crow. Very highly intelligent. Like, you kind of perceive things in order, like, of their use to you. It's, it's kind of not really... I guess, I guess so. But then you could say, like, oh, what, what is the use of grass to me? Other than I like looking at grass, you know. <laughs> I suppose you could, you could. I suppose if you're doing your gardening, Ned, you know, you might perceive the grass as a task to be managed. <laughs> also means that we can learn a lesson in one place and generalize it across many other places, which is also something that animals have a hard time doing, because they they don't know how to do that perceptual initial perceptual generalization. So, see that that's an interesting part, and I feel like the whole thing about autism was kind of like a, a a kind of a springboard to talk about perceptions and things of that nature. I don't think it. I thought it was going to be a lot more to like like the title of the video, how autism and intelligence connect. It's not really that, is it? Um, <laughs> it's not. It's definitely not what the topic of it was about. It's basically about how we perceive things. One thing that does seem to be quite apparent in autistic people that I've talked to myself and through the literature that we do struggle to um, transfer skills between areas in life. So like this very much plays into the idea of the spiky profile. Like some things we are exceptionally good at, other things that people expect us to be good at we're not so good at, you know. For a long time, I've been very good at public speaking. Wasn't so good at chatting to people, actually socializing with people. But people make the connection, they're like, oh, he speaks well, he communicates well, should be good to talk to, like good in social interactions, not necessarily. Um, it's the generalization of those skills. Sometimes it's, it's quite hard for us to apply them to new situations that we haven't experienced before. Um, so that kind of kind of leads us, I guess, to a little bit about like the autistic experience, which, you know, I thought this was going to be a bit more comprehensive on that. But there we go. That is um, Jordan Peterson, How Autism and Intelligence Connects. I think it was posted by Philosophy Insights. Didn't really feel like philosophy to me, to be honest. <laughs> but like a bit of um, psychology. I mean, he's a psychology person, so, you know. <laughs> Me and my dogs are very similar with buses and noise. Dogs and cats and autistics don't like don't noise. Don't like energy shifts either. Yeah, and I think I, there's, there's different reasons for that. I think um, the sensory components for dogs, cats, they actually do have better hearing than us. So they just experience the world very keenly. Um, whereas for us, the sensory overload component of um, our sensory experiences, that the, what causes us to become overloaded by that stuff, um, is due to the 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 interaction between our sensory organs and our brains. So it's not like we have super hearing. We can sometimes be a bit more astute, like acute to um, recognizing small changes in our environment. Um, but it's more like an amplifier that's built into our brain rather than better sight, better taste, better smell, better, you know, audition. Might make us a bit more astute to changes, but uh, we're definitely not, we don't have super hearing. <laughs> I think that's a very mis, like, 
big misconception, I think, that a lot of neurotypicals that I've talked to about it, it's like, oh, if you must have super hearing, like, can you, <laughs> can you hear, can you hear me whispering over here? Like, <laughs> oh my God. And then there's the aspect of energy sifts. Um, in adulthood, in childhood, we tend to struggle a lot with indirect communication. That means body language, tonality, facial expressions, um, little things like that, um, that kind of morph the meaning or the, the intended interpretation of what someone's saying, um, rather than the, like the direct, the actual words that they're saying to you. So, um, usually with that, when we get into adulthood, we do become attuned to it to some degree and we can to, to, to some degree, like observe that something's changed the energy shifts because of because of the negative experiences, you know, humans very attuned to keeping ourselves safe, um, things like that. Um, very important for survival. We always notice things that are different just because, you know, things that are normal, certain, not so dangerous things that are different. You know, we got to analyze them, pay attention to them. Um, and so we can, we can almost become, can almost become a situation where, um, in a lot of circumstances, I've heard this from, um, another autistic person that I podcast with recently and something that I, I noticed, um, in situations, especially within relationships, friendships, um, even parental family stuff, uh, we can almost have like a overreaction to shifts in people's behavior or like the energy, as you would say, like we don't necessarily know why, what it means or what it could mean. Um, sometimes we might, if we're We've worked on our indirect indirect communication skills. It's definitely something that I've worked on. Um, but we can we can sometimes be like have very negative reactions very quickly, and that leads into like stuff like rejection, sensitive dysphoria, which you experience with um, ADHD a lot as well. You know, being hyper aware of changes and assuming the worst. 